Uh, hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you. Uh, I know some people are still getting settled, so I'll do the uh, introductory and housekeeping stuff first. Um, I'm Aaron Merrill. Welcome to our Capitol Hill campus uh, course with Dr. Jason Fickner. The uh, paperwork you have in front of you, the first piece uh, with the picture of this very handsome gentleman, is going to be the second part of this course. Uh, this course is going to follow along with the budget process, outline how it's supposed to work, how it ideally works, um, which is a convoluted process in and of itself. And then next time we are going to talk about the systemic problems in the budget process, the regular pitfalls that crop up time after time, um, despite the best of intentions, and all the ways that we could help address the growing budget deficits and gaps. So that's the flyer. Feel free to pass that around to anybody you feel would be interested in it. Uh, the second piece, or the last piece, the golden paper, is a course survey we take. Uh, just helps us find out how useful this was to you, how we could put on better, more relevant courses in the future. So if you could fill that out now and hand it to either myself or Megan, the girl out front at the desk, that would be great. Uh, or you can fax it. The office fax number, my email are both on there, I think. So um, without further ado, Jason Fickner is Senior Research Fellow at the Mercatus Center. Previously, he served in several positions at the Social Security Administration, including Acting Deputy Commissioner of Social Security, Chief Economist, and Associate Commissioner for Retirement Policy. He, before that, he was a Senior Economist with the Joint Economic Committee. His primary research interests are Social Security, Federal Tax Policy, Budgetary Issues, and Policies Relating to Savings and Investments. He's the author of numerous published studies um, for the JF JEC, which we had a few copies of his PAYGO study floating around. Uh, if anybody didn't get a copy of that and would like one, just let me know. Um, he received his Bachelor of Arts from the University of Michigan, his uh, Master's in Public Policy from Georgetown, and his PhD in Public Administration from Virginia Tech. He also serves on the faculty of the Georgetown Public Policy Institute and the Virginia Tech Center for Public Administration and Policy, where he teaches courses in public policy process, public management, and public administration. Please welcome Dr. Fickner. Thank you, Aaron. So first of all, good afternoon, and thank you for coming to this Mercatus um, Capitol Hill course event. I know your time is very valuable. I spent eight years on the Hill, and uh, this was more than a free lunch for me. I used to come here to these Mercatus events when I was a Hill staffer. And I have a quick question for everybody. How many people here have been in their current jobs for less than one year on the Hill? Raise your hand. How about less than two? Less than five? All right, so we have a, a wide variety of new and some more senior staffers. This presentation sort of leads out from when I was teaching at Georgetown, I found a lot of students go through the graduate school getting a policy economics degree and have no idea about the federal budget at all. What it means, what the process is, how sort of the sausage gets made, if you will, and it's sort of Byzantine rules. And so we thought we'd do this in a two-part section as sort of Aaron laid out. The first part, sort of the primer, and again, this is going to be a very basic overview of the terms, the process, the timelines, and what actually it means to put a budget together, both in the congressional schedule and also from the administration timeline. And then in part two, two weeks from now, we'll start doing more of a graphic presentation about how we got to where we are, what are the problems we're having with entitlements, with deficits, with revenues, um, how we're getting to the more, I think, a partisan atmosphere on the Hill because of the budget process. If you look sort of historically the last 10 years, it's gotten more and more acrimonious. And there's a reason for that, and part of it is that entitlements are taking up a larger share of the budget. And we can talk about that process in two weeks. Uh, but this is basically a primer. So for those of you who have been around the Hill a lot, a lot of it may seem old hat. For those of you that are new, it should give you an understanding of what the budget process is. And I will tell you that it's a very complicated thing. There are probably only a few people in Washington, D.C. who are really experts on it. I am not one of them. Uh, but I know enough to be dangerous. And what we sort of hope with this is that uh, I was talking with one of the gentlemen here um, who's been on the Hill for a while, and he sort of noticed that budgeting really is sort of the big part of the policy process. If we don't budget well, we don't govern well. And if this gets really boring, we're going to go next door and start <laughs> singing with them. Um, the, one of the things that seems to happen with the budget process, you notice it's broken down the past few years. And a lot of people have complained, and I'm like sort of one of them, that when the process breaks down, we break down our ability to govern. So why is that happening? So we're going to go through that process today, and then in two weeks we'll finish up with more graphical presentations. So this is sort of an overview to get us started. Um, don't worry about taking notes. We'll put this presentation online later. 
Um, but there are some terms that keep coming out that sort of confuse people. And these are sort of the main terms that start the budget process. Um, authorization legislation, appropriation legislation, budget resolution and budget authority, budget outlay, impoundment, mandatory spending, or also known as direct spending, discretionary, what is a rescission, uh, my favorite, section 302A and section 302B allocations, sequestration, off budget versus on budget, omnibus appropriation bill, which for a while we've been having over and over again, and what's not on here and should be is, of course, our favorite now, the continuing resolution. Um, so I'll go through these quickly, but we'll cover them more over the next 35, 45 minutes. Um, authorization legislation generally is a prerequisite for appropriations. So the authorization sets up or continues federal agencies or programs. The appropriating legislation, this is what provides the legal authority for federal agencies to incur obligations and spend money. Um, budget, of, sorry, the budget resolution, this is the concurrent resolution that is supposed to get passed every year um, that sets forth the budget framework. It's the aggregate revenues and spending totals. Uh, and in the budget resolution, it may or may not include reconciliation language, which we'll get to. Um, budget outlays in the, is the, uh, the payments or flow of funds. We'll get more into that in a little bit. Impoundment, we don't hear much about impoundment much anymore since the Nixon days. But an impoundment is an act or an inaction by government or an employee that precludes or delays the obligation. Or basically someone saying, I'm not going to spend the money that Congress wants me to spend. Um, mandatory spending, these are all our entitlements. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Discretionary, these are things like defense and uh, education. Uh, a rescission, we're now starting to talk more about rescissions. So rescission is the cancellation of budget authority previously approved by Congress. So there's now discussion in the Congress now about going back and looking at last year's budget and saying, we already gave you this agency this money to spend, but we're going to cancel it now. Uh, that's a rescission. It's taking back money that hasn't been spent, but authority was previously granted. Um, the Section 302 A and B allocations, this is set up by the Congressional Budget Act of 1974. This is the major act that Congress uses. It's been amended several times, but basically is the framework. And if you go through the Budget Act in Section 302 A, it specifies basically the overall allocation for the Appropriations Committee. The 302 B sets out the allocation to the subcommittees. So if you hear 302 A and B, what you're basically saying is what are the spending levels that are given to the Appropriations Committee, and then what's the B as goes down to the subcommittees. It's basically just as simple as that. Um, a sequestration is the cancellation of budgetary resources under the Budget Enforcement Act. You guys have heard a lot about PAYGO and now CUTGO. When PAYGO was more in play historically, what it set out were these budget targets. And it basically said you have over a five-year window these certain caps. You can't go over them within a window. If you do, the Office of Management and Budget was supposed to say, you're over it, we're cutting it, and it's an across-the-board cut. That was a sequestration. Um, but a lot of things were exempt from it, so it basically became a toothless tiger. And that's the paper I wrote for the JEC um, several years ago, which we can get copies of, or it's actually still online at the JEC's website. Um, Off-budget versus on-budget. This doesn't happen as much anymore in conversations, but the general idea was there are certain parts of the federal government, like Social Security trust funds, um, which they want to sort of say, but we're going to put off-budget. And what that means is when you looked at the Budget Enforcement Act and the rules of the federal budget, if there were to be a sequestration, there were some things that were exempt. Social Security was one of them. So if you had a sequestration, there was never going to be a 3 or 5% cut in someone's Social Security checks. So they said, we're going to put that off budget. Um, and, and that's sort of a distinction in terms of what we mostly want to look at is what's called the unified budget. That puts everything together and shows the true fiscal position of the government. It includes the Social Security trust funds, the Medicare trust funds and all the outlays appropriated with it. So when you start looking at federal budget documents, you might see an on-budget, off-budget distinction. I think it's more important to look at them generally combined, and that's the unified budget. Um, of course, we all know what an omnibus bill is. If we can't pass a single spend, all the single spending bills, we wrap up the remainder into one big bill. This is called the omnibus bill. Uh, recently, we've also had what we've called minibus bills, where if you have two or three, you package into one, and that's a minibus instead of an omnibus. But the idea is the Congress has not been able to pass all the appropriations bills necessary, so they wrap up at the end of the year and do an omnibus and throw it all in. So one of the things I think is important to highlight, and this doesn't come out a lot in sort of discussions, a lot of people think the budgeting really is a technical exercise. But they look at budget documents, even from the agency perspective, and they see it as an exercise in how do we spend money, where do we spend money. But we should all know that budgeting is at its very essence a political exercise. The choices that we're making for what to spend or what we choose not to spend money on 
is a political exercise. This is the process that we're all here for. Uh, we're going through these documents, we're going through the allocations, we're going through the debates about what to fund, whether it's health care, whether it's defense, whether it's education. Everything has an opportunity cost. We fund something, we can't fund something else. If we borrow, we're borrowing and that's taking money from somewhere else. Even more granular from the agency perspective, if you start going through an agency's budget request, you may see something that was funded one year ago that is not funded today. Why is the administration making that choice to not fund something? Why are they now funding something different that wasn't funded before? So again, this is all politics. So I think when you're looking at the federal budget from a process standpoint, at the back of your head, always recognize and consider that this is a political exercise. Somebody has made a political choice to include something or exclude something, to fund one thing at one amount over another, and that's gone through a political process. But never just think about it as being dollars and cents. It always is a political exercise. If you keep that in mind, sometimes a lot of these things start making sense if you can't figure out what's going on in the background. In some ways, the politics helps clear it up. So how do we get to the actual now nuts and bolts of the process? So the federal budget, the president's budget, he's supposed to submit it the first Monday of the first full week in February which this year will be February 7th of 2011, and it'll be the FY12 budget. Who thinks it's gonna come in on February 7th? Well, the president's already announced he's gonna be late. Um, usually the budget is on time, but this year it's gonna be late. Any guesses on how late? Who thinks one week? I actually don't know. So this is, this is more of a, I'm, I'm trying to get a feeling. So, you know, this is one of those things too, where I run this as a class lecture. So if you guys have insight, please let me know. Um, you know, because this is interesting. We don't know. Uh, we're not sure whether the president is trying to consider coming forward with some requests or some proposals to reform Social Security. Are they going to step in front of the Congress and try to do something different on health care? Uh, what are they going to do? But something is delaying the budget, and it's not just the numbers. Um, the administration said it was Jack Lew's confirmation being delayed for director of OMB. That did not hold up the budget process. I guarantee you the Office of Management and Budget and all the agency's budget staff can operate without one director being in place. They're doing something. The question is, what is that something? Will we find out in the State of the Union? Will we have to wait till the budget comes out the second week or third week of February? We don't know. But the idea is it's supposed to come out the first week of February on the first full Monday. Now, is the President's budget law? What is the President's budget? It's a request. It's a, a helpful suggestion. Um, it basically tells Congress, here's what the administration's priorities are. This is their budget. And you've heard the old saying before that usually sometimes the president's budget is dead on arrival on Capitol Hill. That's kind of hyperbole. It's never actually dead because a lot of what's in the budget sometimes is the technical reauthorization of programs that have been going on for so long that there might be some main priorities that are considered dead in arrival, but a lot of that budget keeps going year after year and is a continuation of previous congressional <laughs> actions and administrative actions. So it's never quite actually dead, but a lot of times the major pieces can be or a part, obviously, for negotiation of the political process. But it's important to figure out, one, the agency formulation for a budget starts 10 months prior to being submitted to Congress and 18 months prior to the start of the fiscal year. So what fiscal year are we in now? We're, we're in 11. Do the agencies actually have an 11 budget? No, they're operating on a continuing resolution still. They just handed back the passbacks to OMB for the 12, which will come out in February. And they're finalizing books for 10. So in some ways, from an agency perspective, and you guys are here at Congress looking at the agencies, from the agency's perspective, they're at some points always dealing with three budgets. Not only is the 12 budget going to be submitted in February, but they're now working on their 13 budget request with OMB. So in some ways, think about this from a planning perspective. We all think about budgeting as being something you plan for. I know what I'm going to spend last year, what I want to spend this year, what I want to spend next year. But how do you plan for next year if you haven't even got your current budget established yet? And the 12 budget is still going to be being debated. So in the agency's perspective, a lot of this stuff becomes, in some ways, a big variable that's up in the air. They can estimate sort of continuing services, and what they have to do to move forward. But when it comes to like administrative initiatives, think about Social Security Administration. What if the administration decides to do something about solvency in the F-12 budget? How does the agency budget for that appropriately going into 12 or 13 when they haven't even got their 11 settled yet? There are a lot of initiatives that have at the agency level where they need funding for it and sort of certainty. And if that doesn't happen, again, this goes to the idea if we don't budget well, we can't govern well. So, but think about this from the agency's perspective. It's very confusing for them to try to keep in a row all their ducks and try to juggle basically three budgets at once. So that's what's happening. So, then you have what's called the Office of Management and Budget. This is the President's Budget Office in the Executive Office of the Pre President. About 500 people work there, 
and they are the program and budget examiners, and they review basically everything that goes on in the agencies, from the budget requests also to regulations, which is going to be a big issue coming up, I think, in this Congress. Um, so after February 7th, the budget is supposed to get submitted. They also do a checkup, basically six months in, um, July 15th, you have what's called a mid-session review. And the Office of Management and Budget will put out this mid-session review, and it serves as a true-up. When you look at the President's budget when it comes out in February, it gives estimates not only for revenues and outlays, but it gives some economic variables. There are assumptions that go in, what do they think GDP is going to be? What do they think unemployment is going to be? Um, what do they think interest rates are going to be? A lot of people think they're going to go up. What does the administration think it's going to do? All those assumptions go into the budget process and their estimates. So in July 15th, they put out basically a six-month update saying, where are we? How close are we to those estimates? And they revise them. So it's always interesting to watch the administration's perspective of who's being sort of more conservative or more uh, optimistic on budget assumptions and economic assumptions, CBO, OMB, or private forecasters. And it's interesting to watch that because usually um, the Office of Management and Budget is more optimistic than a lot of other forecasters, including CBO and some private sectors. And partly because this becomes, again, a political document. This isn't one that's being paid for by private sector people who are trying to make bets in the market. This is a political document that's being sent to the Hill and the public. So once we get to the budget submitting uh, by the President to the Congress, within six weeks of receiving the budget, the Congress is supposed to send what's called their views and estimates. And, and views and estimates basically, and I put them in quotes because that's sort of how they're, they're treated, um, the committees send up to the budget committees sort of their view and estimate of what they think they're going to need and want to spend for their programs for the year. That's basically sort of starting the framework. And this gets used by the budget committees to start the uh, budget framework with a budget resolution. And the budget resolution provides the revenue and spending framework for the entire budget. Now, this is supposed to be passed by the Congress by April 15th. And there's a smiley face there, and why do you think there's a smiley face there? <laughs> did we pass a budget resolution last year by April 15th? When did we pass a budget resolution last year? We didn't pass one. Did we pass a budget last year? So these are sort of things that are interesting in sort of the process, but if you don't have a budget resolution, no spending, rent, or even debt limit legislation, which is interesting, can be considered before the budget resolution is passed or rules are waived or by May 15th. Um, and this is sort of an interesting thing, too, because we're going to have the debt ceiling coming up soon. Uh, and supposedly, you can't do that until the budget resolution in, in the framework. Now, with everything in Congress, you can always get around it by just saying we're waiving the rules. In the House, you can do it by a simple majority, and the Senate takes 60. Yes, sir? Question. Yeah. The dream of April 15th, does that include the Senate or is it just the House? It's supposed to be both. So the question was, what has to be passed by April 15th? It's the budget resolution in both chambers. That's what's supposed to happen. Yeah, dream. Yeah. <laughs> um, interesting about a budget resolution, it's not law, but it also can't be filibustered in the Senate. So one of the things that's been happening is the President doesn't sign it, and some people have been talking about the idea of making the budget resolution enforceable by law by having it be signed by the president. Right now, it's not. Um, if the budget resolution contains reconciliation language, that also cannot be filibustered. And we'll talk a little bit about what, how that sort of made some bad policy choices for Congress um, in a few minutes. So what is the budget resolution? Again, this was established under Section 301A of the 1974 Congressional Budget Act, as amended. I always add as amended because these laws get amended all the time. But it requires the budget resolution to include, again, aggregate levels of new budget authority, outlays, target levels for surplus and deficits, and the debt ceiling, uh, and aggregate levels of federal revenues. So basically, it says we want to set some sort of framework we think is going to come in from both the outlays and the revenue side. Then you get into our 302, a, our 302 allocations again. And this is the House and Senate Appropriations Committees. They take the 302A allocation and divide it among the uh, subcommittees, and that's your 302B allocation. And there's a new change in the House rules this year, which we'll get to at the end of the presentation about how that's going to make an interesting twist. Budget authority. So when you look at some of the budget documents that come from the administration, you'll see there's BA and BO. So budget authority and budget outlays. And they don't always match. And there's a reason for this. So budget authority is the amount Congress allows a federal agency to commit to spend, where outlays is the amount allowed to flow from the Treasury. So again, think of it as one like a checking account. You might have money in your checking account. That's your ability to spend. When you write the check is the outlays. And this is important for some reason. Like, why do we even have this distinction? You might actually go to an agency and say, we know you want to build a product, a bridge, an aircraft carrier, something that takes longer than a year. 
you can actually schedule in the budget. We'll give you budget authority to engage in a contract with someone over the next five years, but we're going to time when that authority exists for, for outlays. So there's always a difference. Um, programs that last longer than a year or capital expenditures will have different outlays and authority. But again, think if you're a contractor and you look at the congressional budget process, if you're trying to go and you want to be a contractor and the government says, we want you to build an aircraft carrier, it'll take 10 years, and you're seeing this process going on the Hill, you guys can't pass a budget. Why should I sign a contract with you? Well, budget authority allows an agency to sign to a contract for multiple years, and the outlays are when they get paid for it. Uh, again, the difference is one mostly of timing, but again, budget authority represents the limit on how much um, funding Congress provides. And again, Congress can provide authority of an outlay of a budget authority at one amount, but only provide outlay authority less than that. So again, you can do it in an appropriation or an authorization that says, we'll give you $100 million to spend, but we're only going to authorize you to outlay $80 million, and then you can go back and do more later. So it's, again, it's an ability also to check and control spending levels. Um, points of order. Once we've adopted a budget resolution, and again, that's the big if now, once we adopt one, any legislation or amendment that violates those aggregate levels uh, are subject to a point of order. Now, again, in the House, someone could say, look, we have a budget authority of this. Someone made an amendment. You're going above this total amount, point of order. In the House, a simple majority waves the roll. In the Senate, though, you still need 60. Um, reconciliation. This has been a big thing for the last several years. And reconciliation are directives in the budget. It can be a separate document, but lately it's been a directives in the budget resolution that initiate changes in revenue, direct spending, and debt limit laws. Uh, and they're considered under expedited procedures that limit debate and amendments. And that's the important thing. So reconciliation has been used a lot, and we'll talk about how it's been used. Um, like right now. So what's the process? So again, this is a procedure designed originally to facilitate passage of deficit reduction. So you think back when we had, we had deficits as far as the eye could see for a while before we had surpluses as far as the eye could see. When we had that, there was a problem where Congress was unable to pass deficit reduction. Basically, it was the idea, I'm not going to have my ox, sorry, my ox gored without your ox being gored. So how do we do this? So one of the things that was set up is they had reconciliation language, which said, we're going to set targets. General targets leave the details of somebody else. And the general target set out deficit reduction. And they left it to the subcommittees and the appropriations subcommittees to figure out how to actually make those targets. But it set up the general framework. And the House Republicans several years ago figured, well, if we could set targets for deficit reduction, can't we do that for revenue reduction? And that's why tax cuts have been now used in the reconciliation process. So it wasn't originally intended that way. But again, it's a single piece of legislation, but it can be used in the budget resolution. Um, it can't be filled to busted in the Senate, which is important. Um, there is something called the Bird Rule, which means no extraneous provisions can be added. So what the Bird Rule says is if you're looking at a budget document, the budget really focuses on fiscal matters, spending, revenue. You can't throw something else in there like, say, abortion policy. Uh, that would be considered extraneous, and it's sort of to a point of order in the Bird Rule, and it can't be added. Uh, again, though, as anything else, you can waive it by the rules. So in the Senate, that would take 60 votes. Um, also, it looks at the idea of the resolution consists of a budget window. So that is, what are we looking at for the years in which we're scoring legislation? It's five or 10 years, depending. And you can't have any increases that affect the budget outside that budget window. And this is sort of why we've had some problems in the tax legislation. So what, what expired at the end of last calendar year? The Bush tax cuts. Why did they expire? Who, who sets policy that says we're going to have tax cuts expiring? So what happened 10 years ago, when they were going through the Bush tax cuts in 2000, and then also 2003, but the 2000, was there wasn't enough, wasn't basically 60 votes in the Senate to get tax cuts through on a permanent basis. So they had to use reconciliation language. And what that basically said is Chairman Bill Thomas at the time of the Ways and Means Committee put in, and with the Budget Committee's help, said, we want to reduce revenues by $1 trillion over a 10-year window. So that was reconciliation instructions. It said to the uh, Ways and Means Committee and Finance Committee, thou shalt find $1 trillion of reduction in revenues. How you do it is up to you. But they had a general framework, lowering capital gains rates, the estate tax, but everything had to cost no more than $1 trillion in 10 years. If it cost even a penny more outside the 10-year window, it was considered extraneous and required 60 votes. That's why you had all these phase-ins and phase-outs and why the estate tax basically had a $1 million exemption, then $3 million, then a lower rate, then it went away for just one year and then came back again because it had to go back to where it started or else you'd have a spending out to the 10-year window and it would be considered under a point of order. So this is where basically because of the process, 
we put in place a system now that sort of makes temporary changes to policy more current and more readily available than having permanent changes. And that's been sort of the problems we have now, and that's why we have now a two-year extension. And we'll have the same game again two years from now when those tax cuts expire. Um, authorization versus appropriations. Again, the authorization is Congress exercising, exercising its legislative power. Again, this is the, Congress has the power of the purse, but also has the power to create and modify programs. Um, you can establish, continue, or modify an agency or a program or its responsibilities. You can also bar usage of funds in authorization language. So think about the idea of now healthcare reform or healthcare is passed. Um, there's now talk about defunding sort of healthcare. So what does that actually mean? What you could do is say for the Internal Revenue Service under the Department of Treasury, Congress could put an authorization language. Such money as determined for this, but no money shall be spent on enforcement under Section 404B of the, America, of the Affordable Care Act. You can write that into legislation. You could bar use of funds, even things that are already appropriated, or even for things that have been passed and you want Congress to carry out, or that are expected to carry out. You can change this in authorization legislation. Um, it also sets out the terms and boundaries for how spending and appropriations should occur. Now, interesting things, you can't have an appropriation without an authorization. So I can't just go out, if I'm the Appropriations Committee, and say, I'm going to spend $100 million in this program without an authorization committee first authorizing there to be a program in the first place. Um, this, there are rules that prohibit the inclusion of authorizing legislation in appropriations bills. Again, that's so that different committees don't step on each other's toes and you still have some separation of powers both inside the branches of government and Congress. Um, the House, but not the Senate, prohibits appropriations language and authorization language, or legislation, excuse me. But again, this all can be waived under the rules. And that's the biggest thing, too. So the House is always fascinating because the party in power basically drives the rules. They can change it, amend it, basically at will. In the Senate, it's at a continuous body. Unless the Senate, at, as a body, votes to change its rules, it just keeps going from one Congress to the next. Um, so it's harder to get things changed, and it also requires 60 votes. Um, there are a lot of politics, of course, that go under the authorization legislation and appropriation legislation. The committees are supposed to work together. Um, authorization committees and appropriations committees do work together, but there's, of course, some trade-offs that go into that. Sometimes there are turf battles involved, and this can work, you know, in some ways to a benefit of everybody or it can be a detriment to getting things passed. It depends how things happen. But a lot of log rolling happens. Someone says, well, if you want to appropriate that, I want to authorize something. You better back my authorization if you want me to back your appropriation, and sort of some trading goes on. But there is politics, and sometimes it's interesting to look at how the committees work with each other. Um, they usually get along well, but when, when there's not, there's some sort of turf battle issue going on. It's worth sort of looking into. I think it's important, again, to go through what a point of order is. Um, again, it's raised in the House or Senate, and it's supposed to prevent Congress from passing legislation that's not in line with the budget resolution. Uh, again, in the House, it's not really important because it can be waived simply by a majority vote. But in the center, it is subject to filibuster, and it needs 60 votes. So the point of orders are very important. And again, this all goes back to the idea of why it's important with a budget resolution and framework. With that budget resolution, it basically provides, at least in the Senate, a lot of structural support for pushing through what is provided in the resolution, whether it's deficit reduction or tax reductions or revenues. Without that, it's kind of a free-for-all. Uh, and that's been sort of the problem we've had lately, is we haven't had a budget resolution to force sort of constraint in the budget process. Um, PAYGO. Generally speaking, pay-go or pay-as-you-go, it requires tax cuts and entitlement spending increases to be fully offset unless it fits in the targets that are specified in the budget resolution. So again, if they specify you can only spend $100 million and you find a way to do that, you're fine. If you go over that, you've got to find a way to offset it. Um, and we'll talk about what the new cut-go is shortly. Um, now, pay-go expired with the Budget Enforcement Act of 1990. It was amended twice. Um, it extended twice, and it expired after 2002 in the fiscal year. So some of the budget requirements had people looking out five years in the budget window. So in FY 2002, there were still some things passed that had to go under PAYGO for five years out. But basically, as far as statutorily required, now legislatively, it's not a requirement. But the House and Senate both had it as a rule in the last Congress, in the 111th Congress. Um, and it was an important thing about what it means as a House rule. Again, the idea was it's a signal to sort of the public that we're not going to spend more than are specified. If we do, we'll find a way to offset it. But again, you can always waive it by the rules, um, which is easy in the House, harder in the Senate. So what does that change now in the 112th? Um, the 112th has been a fascinating thing because um, in, the, in the House of Representatives with the Republicans now in control, they are at least trying to show they're being serious about fiscal and budgetary impacts. 
So what have they done? They've shifted from controlling the deficit to controlling spending. So you look back, we've talked about the idea of the budget resolution, the frameworks. The idea originally was to try to get deficits under control. And it specified deficit targets, deficit this, deficit that. It wasn't necessarily spending targets or revenue targets. Now the focus in the House is shifting to, we're going to control spending. Not necessarily the deficit. They said that might come along as a secondary effect, but we're really trying to control now spending. So what have they done to change the rules in the House? They now they call cut go. So this is where new mandatory spending has to be offset by mandatory spending cuts alone. Under previous pay go, you could say, I want to, increase, I want to have new legislation to expand Medicare, and I will fund it by a 1% tax. No longer. Under cut go, if you want a new 1% increase in Medicare, you've got to find a 1% cut from somewhere else, not discretionary, but from the mandatory side. So this is now really sort of forcing more budget restriction to try to again control the growth of spending, but not the deficit. Um, it also exempts tax reductions from needing to be offset under House rules. So one of the things about um, the previous rules, say you wanted to have a tax reduction, a tax cut. You had to pay for it, either a tax increase somewhere else, or you had to find an offsetting reduction in spending. In the budget rules, tax revenues are considered mandatory. So you had to offset it with mandatory cuts. You couldn't offset it with discretionary cuts. So if someone wanted to have a reduction in capital gains rates and say it was going to cost $100 billion, Congress couldn't say, I'm going to cut defense spending by $100 billion to pay for it. That wasn't allowed in those budget rules. They had to cut entitlement. And it's, of course, it's very hard to cut entitlements, so it becomes very hard to pay for tax cuts. So now the new rules is we're getting tired of all this temporary tax increases and decreases. We're going to say our focus isn't on revenues, our focus is on spending. So if we want to decrease taxes, we're not going to have it under PAYGO. So that's the new House rules. Of course, this doesn't apply in the Senate. The Senate still has PAYGO. So this is going to be somehow matched up. Um, you now have, of course, spending reduction accounts. Is there, you get confused. Is there a question? I don't want, I don't want people to be confused. So, there's, so the, the thing we need to do is, again, the Congress doesn't act sort of alone. There's a House and a Senate, obviously. So if the House does something, gets something passed, but the Senate doesn't follow, you go nowhere. And one of the problems we've had in the budget process is they haven't always aligned up both pragmatically and in theory how they want to line up. So now you have a new sort of paradigm shift in the House where there is a focus on spending reductions. That is not necessarily in the Senate. So the House could go through their entire process, use cut go, try to pass tax reductions that don't have to be offset. But when they get to the Senate, they're still going to have to be offset. So you still have a problem sort of matching these things two together. And that's going to cause some friction as you go forward in the next several months. Um, the House also now has what they call spending reduction accounts. I use lockbox in quotes. I've always hated that term. Money is fungible. Um, the government can't save. They can't put money in a, in a vault somewhere. It's, it's basically they spend less. They basically borrow less or tax less. But it's a lockbox. And the idea is it's an accounting idea, which basically for discretionary spending accounts, so think defense, education, agriculture, um, you can put aside these reductions for deficit reduction. So if someone says, I want to cut $10 billion from defense this year. There's a joint strike fighter. I don't want the second engine, whatever it is. I'm going to save that money. Instead of that money not being used to offset increases in spending somewhere else, you can allocate this for deficit reduction. You couldn't do that before. Now you can. Yes, sir. My understanding is that there was a Wall Street Journal op-ed on this yesterday, I think. The money that's cut, though, can now be, the appropriations committee gets that money back and they're able to reapportion that to something else. Though, to put back. So, so this is where you get into the House Budget Committee has a lot more authority this Congress than in the last Congress. Um, so the question is, you can now, if you want to, allocate it for this lockbox idea, but they have to choose to do it. And that's the difference. So before, it would go back into the general spending pile. It says if we cut somewhere else, we still have our ceiling, we now have more money to spend because we've cut somewhere. Now the idea is if, if, the, if the House wants to, they can take that cut and put it for deficit reduction in the debt and not have it go back into the general pile. So they, they have the option to do it now, which they didn't that, before. It just takes good faith that they're actually going to go to deficit reduction. That is correct, sir. Um, we also have long-term spending point of order. Um, this is now, we are about the idea of point of order is the budget resolution. If it increased the deficit outside that 10-year window, it's a point of order. Now they have one in the House says legislation that increases mandatory spending by more than $5 billion in any subsequent four decades outside the window is subject to a point of order. Now, I don't know why four decades was chosen, but, but the general idea is this, of course, makes it very hard to pass some sort of legislation in which the costs are shifted away. So one of the things about the health care bill that was recently passed is a lot of the tax increases started early and all the spending started later. So you're pushing the cost down the road. So it made the cost look a lot less in the budget window. 
So this is an idea now saying, we're no longer playing games. If you're going to shift around the spending and the revenues, we want to see a more full cost of it. So we're going to basically include a 50-year window. That's generally the idea. Um, reconciliation. There are now rule changes to reconciliation that will prohibit net increases in mandatory spending, but again, still allow tax reductions. So this is kind of new as well. Um, the elimination of the get part rule. This is one of my personal favorites. Congress does not like to take the personal you know, vote that says we're going to raise the debt limit. So they had something named after former Speaker of the House, Dick Gephardt. Uh, the House will now have to vote for explicitly for debt ceiling limit increases. Uh, before, you could basically pass the conference report from the Budget Committee, which had your budget re resolution in it. And again, the budget resolution, you can specify revenues, outlays, and debt ceiling. So basically, by saying we're voting for the budget resolution, you automatically deem the, the debt ceiling to go higher. Now they're basically going to force the House to take a vote on debt ceiling legislation. So this is new. Um, we now also have the elimination of highway spending guarantee. So um, this eliminates restrictions that prevented the full House from cutting spending levels authorized by the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, which effectively is guaranteeing federal highway spending would rise each year. So what you basically had is there was the authorization committee would say, we authorize spending of $100 billion every year for the next five years. But the Appropriations Committee wouldn't necessarily appropriate that much. But there was a rule that said, well, we're basically going to give it to them anyway. Uh, so we had increased highway spending. Now we've removed that restriction. Um, we're also now something this is very new. The Budget Committee generally in the past has been considered sort of one of the weaker committees. Not anymore. Um, under the House, uh, now Chairman Paul Ryan, he has the ability for FY11, so in the current fiscal year we're in, he has the ability to set FY11 discretionary spending levels for the House Appropriations Committee. This is done in order to reduce FY spending and govern completion of the process, which of course is not yet done. So you now have put Paul Ryan in a very interesting position, which gives him a lot of authority. Appropriators, um, basically they're, they're, there's an old word for them, they're called the Cardinals of Capitol Hill. Uh, the chairman of the appropriations committees are considered to be, you know, these are the kingmakers, these are the ones who spread money around. Uh, you've now taken some of that authority away from them. This is very big sea change for the House of Representatives in Congress. And it gives one person, Paul Ryan, a lot of control to say, you want to spend this, I'm giving you this instead. You can figure out how to spend it, but we're going to get the budget in balance or we're going to reduce spending by this my money. I'm telling you to do it. That's it. Uh, interesting rule change, but it's just for this fiscal year only. So we'll see how that works out. So where does this sort of take us and why are we sort of doing these rule changes? Here's why. Um, why are we, you know, we'll talk about how we got here when we come back in two weeks, but the point is why are we so interested now in budget process and changing rules? What's been going on? So we actually did have a surplus at one point in time. Again, if you guys remember 2000, this is when we had surpluses as far as the eye could see. And the entire world was nervous that the government was going to have so much money they wouldn't know where to put it. We had to have tax cuts. Alan Greenspan was worried we were going to own General Motors. Oh, wait, that already happened. Um, so, but we were all concerned about it. But then, of course, we had tax reductions, which at the time looked necessary, I think, because of the budget surplus issue. But then we had a recession, and you start tapering off. So now we're basically in deficits, as far as the eye can see. And, and they sort of, spending has mounted and increased a lot faster than anyone really anticipated. We really don't have a revenue problem, and we'll show you sort of why we have a spending problem. Spending really has taken off, and we'll sort of show you how that sort of velocity looks. But this is what we're looking at, out through 2010. And a lot of economists sort of say that from a deficit standpoint, we can work with 2%. That's, you know, that's not going to put us in Greece territory or France territory. If we have 2%, it's kind of manageable. In some ways, you want to have some deficit in debt because it allows you to sell transactions in currency markets. In the financial markets, like our treasuries, it gives them sort of a risk-free rate of return. So you sort of need to have some capital markets, not 2%. We could get by with a half percent. But we can manage 2% is basically the idea. So how do we get that or below? Because of this, we're now changing the budget rules. So this is sort of what was going to happen. Um, this is the total deficit or surplus. It gets to 2010. And what was it going to look like if we didn't extend the Bush tax cuts? Um, and the dotted line is what it is because we did. These are all CBO numbers, by the way. So the idea is we're still in, an, in a framework where under current law, we're going to have deficits for a long period of time. So we still have some fiscal challenges to address. Outlays and revenues. This is where I get into the idea we have a, a spending problem, not a revenue problem. So one of the things here, this does work, this is outlays, the powder blue line. This is your revenues. Now this line here assumes the Bush tax cuts were going to expire. They didn't. So what's going to happen is they're going to come right around here, about 
What's interesting to note is that from a revenue side, there's a long-term average that's a little over 18%. What seems to happen, and there's some empirical analysis to support this, is that the economy, our U.S. economy, tends to support 18%. If you raise taxes, people reduce their work incentives and don't seem to work as much, so you get less revenue. Right? If you lower taxes so much, they either work more or invest more, to an extent. I mean, this isn't a, a pure trade-off. But generally, the idea is we're comfortable, it seems, in this economy with an 18% of total GDP of our taxes. And what tends to happen is if we get way above that, people call for tax cuts. If we get way below it, people want tax increases. I mean, people not being us, but I mean sort of the, the general philosophy parts of the debate. So you see this trend happening over and over again. History does repeat itself. Now, we're down here. Now, the reason we're sort of down here, part of it is we reduced taxes under the 2000 and 2001 and three tax cuts, and we just extended them. But also, we have a recession. Um, at some point, the economy is getting better. It'll get better again. So even under these current tax rates, this is going to go up, again, at least by 18 19%. But look at what spending's done. Look at this big actual rise. Now, a lot of this, again, is TARP, um, automatic stabilizers that happen because of the recession. We pay more for unemployment insurance other things. But spending's gone up, and then you're going to basically get health care. Um, Medicare, Medicaid, health care is the 800-pound gorilla. And we'll talk about this in two weeks, but we can talk all we want about reducing the deficit or the debt and spending by $100 billion this year or reducing discretionary spending by X. We ain't going to do squat if we don't tackle the entitlement problem. Whether that's Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and of those, it really is health care. Health care is the biggest driver in our cost right now. Government's a big player in health care. That's where all the money's going, and we'll show you that in two weeks. Um, so with that, I'll break it for questions. Uh, we do have a microphone around. If you have a question, please sort of tell us who you are and what your question is, and we're sort of filming this. Uh, and then in two weeks, we'll sort of go through a little bit more graphically how we got to where we are. We sort of did the process, but what does that mean, and how, what did the process do to the budget to sort of get these deficits and where we're going, and what can we do about it to possibly change it? So with that, I thank you for your time and questions. Excuse me. Thanks for your presentation. My name's Nick Myers. I work for Congressman Rob Woodall. Uh, my question is about the uh, CUTCO procedure. You said that in order to have, if there's going to be an increase in mandatory spending, there has to be a corresponding decrease in mandatory spending. How is it possible to, or I guess how difficult is it to decrease mandatory spending when a lot of that isn't uh, tied up in entitlements that are very difficult to reform? So that's a good question. So one of the things you have with entitlements, so when you think about the idea of the budget process, and we go through this every year on the Hill, you are authorizing and appropriating things like defense education. Entitlements are this very strange animal. They are sort of automatically funding based on previous law. You don't have to refund Social Security every year. It's been previously authorized. It's continuing authorization and appropriation. So it happens automatically. So the thing is, how do you actually reduce that? Cutco doesn't address that. What Cutco basically says is, if you're going to have new spending, new authorization, then you've got to offset with a decrease somewhere else and not raise taxes. So the problem you get into now is, well, okay, that's great. That prevents future increases in new programs. But we have this big problem we've already said today. How do we cut that? Cutco doesn't address that. The only way you're going to get that in some way, shape, or form is to actually have hard targets that basically go in the budget resolution, where we may have to actually have Congress agree that says, you know, again, you have the 13 appropriations committees. You could direct them to find some savings uh, and make those hard choices to find it. Are you guys all experts in the budget now? We can change places. Yes, sir. Um, could you? Oh, pardon me. Uh, could you explain uh, the process of rescissions and deferrals? How Congress acts on them and how often they're used? So the not often. So the the rescission. An interesting point. Just. This isn't really a tax policy thing, but deferral is an interesting thing from a tax standpoint. If you, like a 401k, if you, all you guys here are, should be part of the thrift savings plan, all right? That is not a tax break for you, by the way. It's a tax deferral. You will get taxed on that at some point in time, believe me. So when someone says your 401k is a tax break, it's not. It's a tax deferral. You're being taxed at some point in time. On the budget side, rescissions don't happen often. Now, sometimes they do, for example, like in the current uh, CR, there was a rescission for some money for census where they went to Congress and said, you gave us money to do this, but we actually don't need to do it. We figured out a way to do it someplace else. We don't need to do it. And they rescinded the money. So the question is, when do you have contentious rescissions, where Congress goes and says, I just don't want to fund this anymore? Uh, it does not happen often at all. Because uh, you get basically someone's got an interest in that money. You have 
435 members in the House, 100 in the Senate and administration. Somebody put that money in there for a reason. They want it. Uh, the question is, how do you fight that battle to rescind it? So it's not often. The fact they're trying to do it now is, is, a, is a step in the right direction for budget control. I'm Andrew Peterson from Lee Terry's office. Uh, you just mentioned hard targets. Could you describe a scenario which would set up ha hard targets and what it might look like? It, so the, the, uh, the idea of the hard target is, is you could put in the budget resolution reconciliation language that says for a certain spending category, it has to be, I'm going to make it by number, $100 billion. Let's say you're now spending 130. You are then forcing the Appropriations Committee to find $30 billion in savings. Period. You don't tell them how to do it. You're just saying that's the number. And they have to follow it. So one of the interesting things now about the process, at least in the House side, is you now have a stronger enforcement mechanism uh, under the new rules that allow that to basically happen. The thing is, how do you now do it on the Senate side? So what's, what's interesting, and I'm not sure, how many people here are on the Senate side? Raise your hand. All right. So what would be interesting happening, and I don't know how this is going to play out, but we have the debt ceiling legislation coming up. The House could put in their version some sort of legislated rules that would require the Senate to adopt House rules for the budget resolution, um, basically making some harder caps more likely. I'm not sure that would pass the Senate, though. Uh, but you could do something like that. The question is, will that become part of the marketing campaign that goes into the debt ceiling legislation? And um, I think we're going to start seeing something where someone says, in order to pass a debt ceiling, which we have to do, we want to show that we're making serious efforts to curtail spending. Here's one way to do it, and they might put that in the reconciliation thing in the House and force the Senate to either turn it down or adopt it. But, but that's basically how you do it. You do it in reconciliation in the resolution, saying you can only spend this. You've got to find out how to do it. Anybody else? I was just wondering if, uh, talking about the Senate, um, you, you mentioned that they're still subject to PAYGO. Like, how does that, is that part of their standing rules, or how does that? So, so the, this, again, the, I'm not a parliamentary procedure expert, but the idea is the Senate's a continuous body. It keeps going and going and going. The Senate has to vote to adopt the rules. And I'm not sure they've even adopted the rules yet for the 112th. Ha have they? Does my Senate? So they're still operating under the rules for the 111th. So what basically happens is because it's continuous, they don't change unless the members agree to do so. And it basically takes 60 votes as you can filibuster it. So the idea is PAYGO is still in effect. If they don't want PAYGO in effect, they've got to pass new rules as part of the package. I doubt they will do that. The question is, will there be a political exercise in the House to put it in the budget resolution to force some sort of vote in the Senate? And that's why I don't know. So, yeah, so it's still in, in effect until they repeal it, basically, or vote for something new. I think this gentleman here, Megan, had a question as well. Thanks. I had a question about the debt limit. Um, the, it seemed to me the consensus was that if it wasn't raised, that the government would shut down. And then I heard some... Uh, Republican senators like on Sunday shows saying that's that's not really accurate the government is still getting a substantial amount of revenue and they could spend up to that amount w which of those is accurate um, yes <laughs> so <laughs> this to give you guys so, so we don't play games on what the idea is so what the debt ceiling basically says is again Congress has told the federal government you can borrow up to this that's borrowing authority all right if they're getting revenues in from tax returns, which are coming in through April 15th, that's not borrowing. That's cash. They can still use that to spend. So the Congress has, the Congress, excuse me, the Treasury has a lot of flexibility for a while. When you get to that debt ceiling, all they can do is they can't issue new debt. They can still spend money. How can they do it? You guys are here part of the thrift savings. If you actually have the G fund as one of your selections, they will stop making contributions to your G fund. What they will do is give you an IOU for your IOU. And they'll say, well, had, you, you know, had we been able to borrow we, and buy a debt limit, we would basically have given you this amount of money. So we'll give you an IOU, we'll record the date, and when we have borrowing authority again, we'll make you whole. So they can stop those kind of transfers. There are other transfers to trust funds they can stop doing. And again, they can still get revenue in from um, tax returns. Now, let's say you get to the point where, all right, we spent all the money coming in. We don't have a debt ceiling increase. We're stuck. What can the government do then? Technically, the government doesn't have to default on its debt. They could default on other obligations. Federal employees, do you want to get paid this week? Eh, sorry, we can't borrow money for it, so we're going to stop that payment. Defense contractors, contractors, we'll pay you next month. There are things we can do to still keep the government operating, um, basically in almost like a, um, a pay-go type environment, wherever money's coming and we can put out, and we can forestall certain obligations. 
The thing is we don't want to default in the debt. That's sort of the last option. So you start going through what do we stop funding first, and you can figure out the scenarios where you'd stop funding maybe certain contractors, certain federal employees. Um, you could also give partial payments. But default is a long way down the list. The problem is when you start sending signals to the market that you're willing to get there, you have a credibility issue. Um, so I, I think the general consensus is, one, we need to pass a debt ceiling limit. But two, we also should make this a credible time to have a discussion, or else why do we have a limit in the first place? about we should, we don't have to, it's not, a, it's not a free credit card. So what does it actually mean? Can we actually put something in place? And we've done this in past debt ceiling increases. There has been language to control deficit spending in those, in those vehicles. We should probably do that again now, or at least have the discussion. Um, can you speculate a little bit on what would happen in the capital markets that would be trading the treasuries if the debt ceiling limit wasn't raised? If I could do that, I'd be getting paid a lot more and wouldn't be here. So the, the question is, can you speculate? I, I, I think it's, a cautionary note. No one thinks we're going to default. We've never defaulted on, on, our, on our debt. This is one thing that both parties agree with. We're not going to default. You start playing the brinksmanship where you start saying, okay, well, we'll, we'll force either government to close down for a day, or we're not going to fund the thrift savings plan, or maybe we take a federal employee paycheck and move it one week later. Doesn't have much of an impact in the markets, but it's when they start seeing that maybe you're cracking that foundation, then you'll start seeing what basically becomes an increase in the interest rates they want. So right, right now, the thing is, because the federal government stands behind its bonds and its, and its obligations, the US government can borrow at very low rates. Uh, and because there are certain obligations in the private sector that have to invest in government securities, do you want to own bonds from Greece, from Spain, from Portugal? So even though we're having large deficits, we're still capital flight comes to us. We can still have the low interest rates. If that goes away, rates go up, which means our borrowing cost goes up, which means our cost for doing business in this country goes up. No one wants to see that. On the flip side, it seems like the markets also want to see a credible plan for bringing our spending in line. So the debt ceiling limit legislation could be a vehicle for having that discussion and putting forward a realistic, credible plan that says, we didn't get here overnight. We're not going to solve it overnight. But here's what we plan to do over the next few years to get us on the right track. Anybody else? Well, then I thank you for your time. Appreciate you coming, and hopefully I'll see you guys in two weeks.